Well, I want to thank CSIS for hosting me this afternoon. Um, this is the one year anniversary of the United States leaving the Iran deal, and I thought this would be a good time to give an update on um, <clears throat> the progress of our maximum economic pressure campaign and the way forward. When Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, went on television in March for a public address, he had an urgent message to convey. Nasrallah made a plea for cash, stating that, quote, public support was needed to sustain their operations. The world took notice. Nasrallah's plea was unusual because it was the first time ever that he had publicly appealed for money. Historically, Hezbollah has relied largely on Iran for its support. Over the years, Iran has provided it with $700 million annually, which makes up about 70% of their operating budget. Hezbollah has used this money to build one of, the, uh, one of the most lethal arsenals of any terrorist group in the world. Today, it has thousands of precision rockets, missiles, and small arms. If we get missiles and small arms. If we don't take a new approach, Hezbollah would continue to rely on Iran's funding for its arms, training, and expertise. Nasrallah would continue to dip into the group's vast illicit bank accounts to pay its fighters and expand its infrastructure. And Iran's clerics would continue to subsidize Hezbollah's social services. But we are taking a new approach. President Trump and Secretary Pompeo have made sure of that. Today, on the one year anniversary of the US withdrawal from the Iran deal, Hezbollah's financial woes are just one among many indicators that our pressure campaign is making a difference. Today, I will reflect on the progress that we have made over the past year and discuss the way ahead. This administration is committed to promoting a policy of peace and security in the Middle East. As part of a coordinated strategy that we are implementing, we are holding Iran's government accountable for its revolutionary foreign policy, which has caused so much death and suffering in the Middle East and well beyond. The regime's announcement today that it intends to expand its nuclear program confirms our threat assessment and underscores the need for action. We will not be held hostage by Iran's nuclear blackmail. While we are still reviewing the technical implications of its announcement and working closely with our European allies, the Secretary has been clear. Either you comply with the deal or you do not. Cheating just a little bit is still cheating. And in the context of Iran's nuclear commitments, it will not be tolerated. The United States is committed to denying Iran uh, all paths to a nuclear weapon. And we will continue to impose maximum pressure on the regime until it abandons its destabilizing ambitions. For the first time in a very long time, we are raising the costs of Iran's expansionism and making clear that this kind of blackmail will no longer work. We are making it unsustainable for Iran to support terrorist proxies and militias that for decades have defied the basic standards of behavior observed by normal countries. Since taking office, our administration has designated, has sanctioned almost 1,000 individuals and organizations in more than 26 rounds of sanctions. We have targeted Iran's financial sector we have sanctioned more than 70 Iran-linked financial institutions and their foreign and domestic subsidiaries. The SWIFT financial messaging system matched many of these designations and disconnected sanctioned banks in Iran. In November, SWIFT even disconnected the Central Bank of Iran. This step was important because it maintains the integrity of its system as well as the global financial market. Iran is more financially isolated today than when this administration took office two years ago. Last month, we designated the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a foreign terrorist organization. 
The designation highlights the plain fact that Iran not only supports terrorism through its proxies and militias, but also engages as a government in terrorism. The IRGC has institutionalized terrorism. It was recently disclosed by the State Department that from 2003 to 2011, the IRGC and the Quds Force were responsible for the deaths of at least 603 American service members in Iraq. That is 17% of the total deaths during the Iraq war. Iran is also responsible for taking hostages and wrongfully detaining numerous U.S. persons, several of whom remain in captivity today. As always, we call for the immediate and unconditional release of these innocent Americans. Our most significant step recently is the decision to zero out all purchases of Iranian crude oil and condensate. As Secretary Pompeo recently announced, no future exceptions will be granted to importers of Iranian crude oil. This step is historic because it will deprive the regime of as much as $50 billion a year which is about 40% of its annual budget. As we have said from the start, zeroing out purchases of Iranian oil restricts the ability to export revolution across the region. We see this with Hezbollah, but we also see it with Iran's other proxies and uh, other proxies in Syria and beyond. Iranian-backed Shia fighters are going unpaid and the services that, that they once relied on are starting to dry up. As one Shia fighter said uh, in Syria to the New York Times, the golden days are gone and will never return. Iran doesn't have enough money to give us. This is what it truly means to raise the cost of Iran's behavior and make its violent foreign policy cost prohibitive. We have zeroed out purchases of Iranian crude and condensate in a measured way, working, working closely with our allies and partners. Oil markets are stable and well supplied. We expect the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and others to fully offset the reductions in Iranian oil exports. It is also worth adding that since uh, President Trump took office, the United States has increased our production by some 3.5 million barrels in one of the greatest role reversals in the history of the energy market. It is also worth noting that the price of Brent crude oil today, trading currently at around $70, is lower than it was one year ago, and that is after we have announced an end to all Iranian oil purchases, which make up 3% of global oil supply. While we are cutting off Iran's oil sales, we are also targeting the regime's vast illicit oil shipping network. In a desperate attempt to turn a profit, this regime is, sh is shipping illicit oil to enrich the Assad regime, Hezbollah, and Hamas. Secretary Pompeo has dispatched diplomatic teams around the world to work with our allies and partners to, to target and prevent this activity. We have been working with countries on almost every continent to identify rogue oil tankers and disrupt their operations. I'll give you one example. Nearly 80 tankers that move illicit Iranian oil have been stripped of their maritime flags that they need to sail. Our oil sanctions, combined with other elements of our pressure campaign, have reduced Iran's investments in its military capabilities. Our pressure is constraining Iran's power projection. Under the nuclear deal, Iran's military budget, uh, Iran's military spending steadily increased each year during the life of the deal. And it peaked in 2017 at nearly $14 billion in military spending. But from 2017 to 2018, when our sanctions went back into effect, we saw a reduction in Iran's military spending of nearly 10%. Iran's 2019 budget, which was just released in March, called for even steeper cuts. It proposed a reduction of 28% in 
in overall defense spending. That includes a 17% cut in the budget of the IRGC and the Quds Force. I think everybody would agree that denying Iran funding to support its expansionist military is always a good thing. As we reverse the regime's strategic gains in the region and cripple its ability to invest in its military machine, we are also bringing about unprecedented financial pressure on the economy. Since our exit from the Iran deal last May, the, the, the real has lost two-thirds of its value and today is nearing a seven-month low. Economic growth, which expanded by 3.8% in 2017 under the nuclear deal, is expected to contract by as much as 6% in 2019. Iran is currently in recession. Inflation is nearing 50%, with inflation for goods as high as 60% year on year. By nearly every measure, the regime is weaker today than when we took office two years ago. Its proxies are underfunded and demoralized. Unless the regime demonstrates a change in behavior, the pressure will mount. On the one year anniversary of exiting the Iran deal, it is important to recall why we ended our participation and reimposed this pressure in the first place. Some who supported the Iran deal did so either because they believed it would be the first step um, in a more comprehensive process to address Iran's malign activity or that it would moderate the regime's behavior over the life of the deal. Neither turned out to be the case. As today's announcement by Iran that it, will new, that it will renew nuclear work makes clear. After the deal was concluded, Iran's compliance with temporary, un, uh, with temporary nuclear limits became a prism through which countries assessed all of Iran's malign activity. The Iran deal has come at the expense of a more peaceful and stable Middle East. Almost all of the other nations in the, in the region, both the Arab nations and the Israelis, will tell you this. Iran increased the scale and the scope around the region under the cover of the Iran nuclear deal. In Yemen, Iran helped fuel a humanitarian catastrophe by backing the Houthis. Its support has done nothing but prolong and intensify suffering. In Syria, Iran supported Assad's brutal war machine as it killed hundreds of thousands of people and displaced millions. Under the cover of the Syrian war, the IRGC is now trying to plant military roots in Syria and establish a new strategic base to threaten Syria's neighbors, such as Israel. In Lebanon, the Iranian regime's goal of using Hezbollah to provoke conflict with Lebanon's neighbors threatened the safety of the Lebanese people. IRGC backing enables Hezbollah to use murder, terrorism, and corruption to intimidate other Lebanese parties and communities. Too many nations have become resigned to Iran's destabilizing role in these and other conflicts, and too few have been willing to challenge it. The nuclear deal fed this dangerous cycle. Low expectations begot bolder Iranian expansionism. This is partly why President Trump exited the Iran deal. He could not continue to lift sanctions on Iran while its threats to peace and security grew. While we upheld our end of the nuclear bargain, Iran felt free to engage in and sponsor terrorism, develop and proliferate ballistic missiles, foment regional conflicts, hold U.S. citizens hostage, and brutalize its own people, all while maintaining sensitive nuclear technologies and a vast nuclear archive to preserve at least the option of renewing a nuclear weapons program. Leaving the deal has allowed us, over the past year, to fully reimpose our pressure and to restore several basic demands on Iran. This includes ending production of fissile material, which could be used for nuclear weapons, 
fully disclosing past nuclear weapons activities, stopping enrichment, closing its heavy water reactor, stopping the development and testing of ballistic missiles, halting the arbitrary detention of U.S. and, and dual national citizens, and ending support to terrorist proxies and non-state actors. We could not have achieved this significant pressure while working within the confines of the nuclear deal. We tried, but it couldn't be done. We are now working with our allies to see that these basic demands are met. The United States is not alone in our demand that Iran behave like a normal country. Our European partners have pushed back against Iran after it was linked to two failed terrorism plots in Europe last year. In January, the European Union sanctioned Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and two of its agents for their roles in terrorism in Europe. The EU Foreign Affairs Council in February issued a statement calling out Iran for its ballistic missile program. It also opposed Iran's malign activity in Europe, as well as its ongoing role in regional conflicts. Many European countries, including the UK, Germany, France, Denmark, the Netherlands, Albania, and Serbia, have acted to address Iranian terrorism on their soil, whether by recalling ambassadors, expelling Iranian diplomats, eliminating visa-free travel, or denying landing rights to Mahan Air, as Germany and France recently did. It is a common press narrative that is completely false that America is acting alone in its efforts to counter Iran's aggression. We are working with many of these same partners to fully implement UN provisions related to Iran's ballistic missile activities. The United States, UK, France, and Germany have together repeatedly highlighted Iran's defiance of UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which calls upon Iran not to undertake any activity related to ballistic missiles that are designed to be capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And that includes launches using ballistic missile technology. We relayed together our strong concerns to the UN Secretary General following Iran's launch of a medium range ballistic missile in December and its attempted satellite launches in January and February. Just recently, the UK, France, and Germany wrote to the UN Secretary General to underscore their concerns with Iran's ongoing missile activity. We are confident that our shared assessment of the threat from Iran will continue to translate into even more shared action. Just last week, I went to New York and briefed the UN Security Council on the importance of holding Iran accountable for its defiance of UN Security Council resolutions related to its ballistic missile program. I also reiterated to the Council the need to fully implement the Council's legally binding travel restrictions and arms embargoes which Iran continues to violate. I also reminded the Security Council that in 18 months provisions under the Iran nuclear deal start to expire. The Iran deal and its accompanying UN Security Council resolution will slowly unravel year after year, lifting restrictions on the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. All of the shared ac activities that I've just described were undertaken together with our partners after we exited the Iran nuclear deal. Contrary to the narrative that, you, that the United States is alone in countering Iran's threats to international peace and security. As we strengthen our efforts to pressure Iran and revitalize our engagement with allies and partners, we are also reframing the argument for why the international community must confront Iran's role in the region sooner rather than later. We are one errant Iranian-supplied missile away from a regional conflict. This alone should be enough motive for countries to act. But there are also broader strategic benefits to confronting Iran's hegemonic ambitions. Rolling back Iran's power projection in the region today will make it easier to address other regional challenges in the future. It seems like common sense.
But this has not been the conventional thinking up to now. The more traditional view has suggested that without progress on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict first, there can be no progress on other conflicts in the region. Resolving peace between Israel and the Palestinians has traditionally been viewed as a necessary condition for resolving other flashpoints, such as Iran's destabilizing behavior. This is a concept also known as linkage. Um, what we see today is a kind of reverse linkage. The landscape of today's Middle East challenges the understanding of linkage. Addressing Iran's threats now is critical to resolving many of the region's other conflicts. When, when you look at the challenges in the region, from the peace process to some of the conflicts that I referenced earlier, Iran's operations lie at the heart or very near the heart of every single problem. It supports Palestinian terror, uh, terror groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, which undermine the aspirations of the Palestinian people. These groups are responsible for the barrage of missiles that recently terrorized innocent Israelis. We condemn these acts. Iran also exports missiles and terrorist expertise to the Houthis in Yemen. It makes possible the war in Syria by propping up the Assad regime and pouring in money and troops. Nowhere in the region are peace and prosperity compatible with Iranian influence and support. If we intend to resolve conflicts in the region, address humanitarian crises, and give sovereign nations the opportunity to prosper, we must first address Iran's destabilizing actions. Until we do, we should expect more of the same. States in the region and around the world are increasingly recognizing this fact. Arab states and Israel in particular have recognized it. In Warsaw, we gathered 65 nations for a ministerial on promoting peace and security in the Middle East. Iran's foreign policy has brought Israel and the Arab world into greater alignment. It is important the international community not overlook the fact that those countries in the region that are on the front lines and which have the best vantage point see eye to eye. They are speaking with one voice to confront the common threat of Iran and seeking international pressure on Iran to deter its aggression. President Trump is answering this call and Secretary Pompeo is committed to encouraging other nations to join this effort. Together we can restore the seriousness and purpose of the international community's resolve to address Iran's threats. We all agree that Iran has such great potential. Its history is deep and its culture is among the richest in the world. We recognize the exceptional nature of the Iranian people. Their accomplishments are unparalleled, especially within the diaspora. Iranians are thriving all over the world, but they aren't thriving in their own country. The U.S is ready to engage an Iranian government with mutual respect. But for this to happen, the regime must come to terms with the fact that its revolutionary ideology is incompatible with a secure and stable Middle East. Iran cannot, on the one hand, claim to be the guarantor of regional stability, and on the other, routinely undermine the sovereignty of its neighbors. If the clerics in Tehran choose, as the Iranian people are demanding, to play by the rules, respect the sovereignty of their neighbors, and abide by international obligations and commitments, the United States will be ready and willing to engage. Thank you.